and a Rockefeller Council on Foreign Relations member. It's called NSSM 200. You can download it off the internet. It's several hundred pages, you need to read it. NSSM 200, 1974, which talked about population control, particularly for African people. That was in 74. The same year, if not one year prior, the American Psychiatric Association declassified homosexuality as a mental disease and made it a regular form of relationship. Although they did that, they also said in their position paper that there was no scientific evidence to prove that people were born with that type of an inclination. What is the point you're making, Dr. Umar? The point that I'm making is that the CIA and the FBI helped fund the LGBTQ movement as a population control strategy. Let me go a step further. Where was Kamala Harris last week? In Ghana. Doing what? Telling the president, if you don't make same-sex relationships normal in here, it might affect your money. She threatened the president of Uganda that if you don't strike down the homosexual laws, we're going to cut your money. Trivia question. Why does the United States government care at all how African countries choose to legislate family? It's because of population control. A homosexual black man in the United States of America has a 50% chance of dying before his natural age. Black women lead the world. Heterosexual black women are one of the highest AIDS, positive HIV diagnosis population in the world. The strategy is real simple. Homosexualize the males and let them infect the women. Population control. The Food and Drug Administration announced last year that for the first time since the 1960s, teenage pregnancy for black girls has dropped and they don't know why. Of course we know why. Because former President Barack Insane Obama was given the agenda of going into the public schools and making the public schools safe for LGBTQ. Now there's something I bet you would agree with me on. And you know what that is? Whether you support same-sex relationships or not, I think we can all agree that prepubescent children have no business at all being introduced to any type of sex, whether it be heterosex or same-sex. So why are there so many public schools across America introducing same-sex relationships in kindergarten, first grade, second grade? Somebody just sent me a book in the mail last week called The Gay BCs. Now, listen to me. Listen. Now, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you review. Don't be emotional though. Remember, once you get emotional, don't be emotional. We can't solve our problems that way. You understand? Children do not desire naturally an appetite for intimacy until prepubescence, right? 11, 12, 13. So if children don't desire sexual intimacy, intimacy with the opposite sex until their body starts preparing for them to reproduce, what is the purpose of teaching gay sex or straight sex to kindergartners? You want to brainwash, you want to indoctrinate, you want to socialize, and you want to manipulate, all in the service of what? Population control. What did former Secretary of uh, State Hillary Clinton say? She said the number one threat to American foreign interests was what? Terrorism? No overpopulation and which continent is projected by the United Nations to have the largest population in the world in the next 50 years Africa now here's another question for you why did Kamala Harris go to Iran or Iraq or Saudi Arabia which are some of America's biggest trading partners where homosexuality is illegal she didn't threaten to cut off their money if they didn't make gay marriages legal they're only threatening to cut off Africa's money if they don't make gay marriages legal because they're trying to get rid of us there is a scientific movement called eugenics please look it up EUG E-N-I-C-S, eugenics, the selective repopulation of white and the selective extermination of black people. Homosexuality is being funded by the government to reduce the numbers of black people in the world. Just like feminism, for my young ladies out there, please do your research, don't believe nothing I say. Feminism was created by the FBI and the CIA to get women out the home so the government could indoctrinate the children through television and social media any way they felt like it. Believe nothing I say, the information is out there. Do your research, your rebuttal. 
Uh -huh. So as an education major, what if a kindergarten child has two moms and two dads? And that's what they're used to. And they ask that in the classroom. What do you do about that? And that's what they're used if they ask what in the classroom? Like, is this normal? My two moms and two dads? If I'm the teacher in a public school, I would say I cannot entertain that. I, I wouldn't entertain that as an issue. Because I'm in a public school, and in a public school funded by the U.S. government that has a pro-LGBTQ agenda, if I answer that from an African traditional cultural perspective, that it is not our way of life, I could lose my job. I'm saying if you want me to treat same-sex relationships as a normal, natural, healthy way of family development, you would have to show me a traditional African society that existed before the arrival of the enslaver and the colonizer that treated same-sex relationships as normal. I can assure you, you can't find a single one. How would you answer that if you was in a, like a private school, a school, school, turn point? I'm about to interrupt you. But she, you said if you was in a public school, but how would you answer if you wasn't? Because Let's take my school, Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. I probably would still not answer it because it's such a politically charged issue and the government is funding it that I think I would stay away from it anyway. You, you follow me? Now, if I'm in a community, I'm very careful with people's children. You feel me? So if I know that child has two fathers or two mothers, I'm not going there because although I disagree with the lifestyle, I don't want to upset that child's understanding of life so much that it could confuse them. You know, it's just like when people like to open up the Bible and show Christians all the inconsistencies in their religion. I wouldn't do that. You know why? Because for all I know, that Bible might be the only thing keeping her from going back to selling her body on the street. That Bible might be the only thing keeping him from shooting somebody in the head. That Quran might be the only thing that keeps him from taking his own life. You follow me? So whether or not I know something to be true or false, I still have to put it within context of where that person is in their psychological, emotional, and political development. I believe that there's no compulsion in African consciousness, just like there's no compulsion in religion. So that is to say, I would never try to force my sister here and say, listen, you find as I don't know what, it's a million brothers waiting for you when you get up out of here. I'm not gonna do that, you understand? That's where she is right now, and I might come back and see her 20 years later, and she might be happily married with five kids. I don't know, or you might be married to a woman. Either way, I'm gonna love you with my sister, because you're my sister, but we're gonna agree to disagree on how family should be structured. Who was my number two? And guess what? And guess what? I'm still going to post your picture when you send it to me. Queen, give me your number two. I was Polly Sai. What's your hometown? I'll be speaking in Jersey City on May the 25th or 6th at the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Go right ahead. Congrats. I was wondering how you feel about black students on campuses that are campus-wide and how they are trying to dismantle the system. And how they are trying to dismantle, give me the rest of that. When you say the system. Understood. And I was black student union president and I was a SGA member, but not the president. I was the secretary. College is your training ground for the racist society that you're going to enter. And with that being said, I want all y'all to master how to deal with racism at Pace University. Because if you make a mistake in understanding racism or interacting with racism at Pace University, you will live to correct that mistake because college is a place of learning and education. When you get out into the real world, if you make a mistake in dealing with racism, how to navigate it and how to deal with it, it could cost you your job, your livelihood, or your life. So 
The benefit of a black student at a PWI is you get a early firsthand introduction and test run into the white power structure. Everything you're going to see outside is right here on this campus. Learn it, master it, and navigate it, but never run from it. Don't run from it. And to that point, there's three things you better learn how to do if you're going to survive racism. And believe me, I had to survive it. I still survive it. I was the only black man in damn near every grad class I went to. Most people thought I was there because I was tall. They thought I was a basketball player. Nobody told them I can't play. But anyway, number one, document everything. European culture is more written than oral. African culture is more oral than written. In other words, if me and this brother make an agreement and we shake on it, that's as good as a contract. That's African culture. In American culture, not so. If you make a verbal agreement with somebody and you don't have no proof on paper that they did it, it never existed. And a lot of times we get caught up as African people is we still believe in the honor system. I gave you my word. That means nothing in America. It must be on paper. Document, document, document. Your teacher keeps on regularly giving you low grades. Did you write her a letter? Did you send her an email? You have to have a paper trail when you're dealing with white racism. Paper is more important than the truth. You must document everything. Keep a journal. Dates, times, places, and details. It will save your life. That's number one. Number two, you cannot be emotional dealing with white racism. There are people who will push your buttons on purpose to trigger you and then accuse you of being the angry black woman or the angry black male. Keep your emotions under control. The minute you get emotional, you just lost. Number three, we can do more together than we can do by ourselves. If you're having a certain problem with a certain issue on campus, why are you fighting it by yourself? Go and find three or four other African students. Go and find three or four other brothers. Go and find three or four other sisters. Fight it as a group. One of our big problems as African people in America, no matter what our language is, is we have a tendency to always fight alone, not as a group. Group work, or should I say teamwork makes the dream work. Let's fight together. Great question. What you doing after uh, undergrad? Okay, you gonna keep going. Good, keep going. And that's another thing. When you're done with undergrad, go straight to grad school. I don't want nobody taking no time off between undergrad, oh, I'm tired, I need a break. No, you don't, because you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna get pregnant. Oh, this is real. Listen, fellas, women, that's not offensive, it's the truth. I used to work in admissions office in college. Women get pregnant when they take breaks off. Fellas get women pregnant. That's not sexist, it's the truth. Stop being sensitive. Now, listen to me. When you take a break, you're going to get a job, you're going to get a car, you're going to get an apartment, you might end up with a child, and now you have to do what? Sustain your lifestyle. And now paying your bills becomes more important than taking your classes. Are y'all following me? When I was in grad school, I went straight from undergrad. When you go to grad school broke, you work harder. When you go to grad school broke, you remember why you're there. When you pull up to grad school with a Benz, or some Balenciaga or some Gucci's on your feet. You might not be as motivated because your mind is going to start playing tricks on you and say, you already got it going on right now. What you need this master's for? You already got it going on right now. Don't play them games with your mind. Go to grad school broke. Straight out of undergrad. Go straight back. And I know you don't like all white Pace University, but guess what? If you want to get a full scholarship for grad school, you will stay your ass right here at All White Page University. You know what I tell students? I work with students, they say, Dr. Uma, I want to go to an HBCU. Don't get me wrong. I would love for all of you to go to grad school at an HBCU. I really would. I never had a chance to go to an HBCU. I was going to get my PhD at Howard, and they took forever to send me the application. By the time I got the application, I had already got accepted by the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, right? Now, I would love for you to go to an HBCU. But if grad school at HBCU is going to cost you twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, and at Pace University you can get a graduate assistantship where they're going to flip your whole bill, and all you got to do is serve as a dorm director or director of university sports or work in the financial aid office, then you're going to stay right here at Pace. Because when you're completely done with your education, I want you to not only have your degree, I don't want you to have no student loan debt. Are y'all following me? 
go with the money. And unfortunately, at most HBCUs, the black students are considered the majority and the white students are considered the minority. So sometimes you got to stay at a white school to avoid the student loan debt. Keep your loan debt down. Good question. Who's my number three? Yes, sir, King. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, my name is Louis Page. I'm not a student here. I'm a uh, My question is, what does it take for South Africa to join these other countries as far as uh, Bricks. Bricks. Here's my take. Whoever controls the resources of Africa controls the world. Whoever controls the resources of Africa controls the world. If you study World War I and World War II closely enough, you will find that who intended to control Africa has something to do with the initiation of those wars. The Cold War between Russia and America was over what? Who gonna control Africa? What is the current war between China and America? Who gonna control Africa? And what is the war now between the G7 and BRICS? Who gonna control Africa? So you got Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They're about to cause a major nightmare for the Federal Reserve because they're about to put out their own currency which is gonna be backed by their gold. Why is that a problem for the US dollar? The US dollar was taken off the gold standard a long time ago. That money in your pocket has no monetary value, excuse me, no mineral value. That's why it says promissory note. It is an intent to pay. It is not the equivalent of a mineral amount. That's why Barack Obama killed Gaddafi because Gaddafi was working with the Sub-Saharan African leaders to float an African currency. And since Africa is the most mineralist continent in the world, if you have an African dollar that's backed by the gold, the diamond, the coltan, the gas, the oil, guess who has the most uh, expensive currency in the world? Africa. So that's why Barack Obama had to kill Gaddafi. So BRICS is about to do exactly what Gaddafi did, only difference is BRICS is gonna tie it to gold, whereas the African leaders was gonna tie it to all the resources. So this, I don't know how America is going to deal with this because once that BRICS currency backed by gold hits the market, it's going to automatically drop the value of the U.S. dollar. Now, let me take that to the psychology. Why is that relevant for African people in America? All of us, most of us are African people in America. It's relevant because since we come from a legacy of enslavement, whether that's New Jersey enslavement, or Pennsylvania enslavement, or Puerto Rico enslavement, or Cuban enslavement, or Haitian enslavement, all we've known for the past 400 years was a white slave master. And many of us never thought that the white man can ever be outdone by anybody else. So in your lifetime, you are literally going to see the slave master of the African have to take a back seat to a new global authority, which will be headed by the Chinese. And let me be clear, Chinese is only using BRICS to advance their agenda to control the resources of Africa. Because at the end of the day, Russia is white, China is yellow. They don't ultimately trust each other, but they're working together because they have a common enemy. My enemy's enemy is my friend. That's why Russia and China cooperating. They will have to split at some point. You know why? White supremacy will not cooperate with yellow supremacy. Russia and China's union will last only as long as they get to dominate the American dollar. They will split because both of them have an agenda of global conquest. And it can only be one dictator. You've never seen a double dictator or a twin dictatorship. So at some point, Russia and China are gonna go back to odds at each other. Remember, when Mao Zedong went to visit Joseph Stalin many years ago, Joseph Stalin wouldn't even shake Mao Zedong's hand. He said, the Chinese are so far beneath me, he wouldn't even shake his hand. So Russia has a very long history of being racist against the Chinese people. You feel me? So this is just a temporary alliance to destabilize American global interests. I want American global interests to be destabilized, but guess what? Russian imperialism is going to be no better than American imperialism. Chinese imperialism is not going to be any better than American imperialism. And I add something else about the Chinese. If they take over Africa, which means Africa is going to have to have a second revolution for independence. We had the first one in the 60s. We're going to have to have another African global revolution for independence against the Chinese. And this is going to be 50 times more violent and 50 times more bloody. Because what's the difference between the white man and the China man? The white man is a numerical minority on this planet. 
He's less than 10% of the planet Earth. The Chinese are second only to the Africans in terms of global population, and they're just about tied with the East Indians. And mind you, even though we have the most people, half of our people don't claim African. You see that? So if we gotta go to war with China for control of Africa, that's gonna be one hell of a war. See, the European, when he took Africa, he had to use technology, manipulation, psychological strategy. Chinese don't have to do that because they have the numerical strength to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with African people. The white man doesn't have the numerical strength to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, white pe with black people, so he had to use us. Chinese don't have to use us, he got enough of his own. I am very disappointed in Jamaican leadership. I'm very disappointed in African leadership. I'm very disappointed in a lot of Caribbean leadership because we are letting the Chinese have their cake and eat it too. And once the Chinese finish gobbling, gobbling up the Caribbean, gobbling, gobbling up Africa, gobbling, gobbling up Central and South America, he gonna do just what the white man did 200 years ago. I have everything I need. This is now my country and you're gonna work for me for free. We are witnessing re-colonialism all over again in yellow skin instead of white skin because we have not learned from our history. Who's my number three? Four, four, King. My question is two parts, so let me wrap. The first one goes like this. Is race involved in every decision or everything that goes on in your day-to-day -day life? And secondly to that, I've had conversations with people in here where, not racism, I meant to say colorism, so like you have someone like Bad Bunny, who's on the TV, he's on the Grammys, he's on everything, but he has a sound that comes from black people within his country, as you spoke of before, who wasn't really acknowledged. Is he a culture vulture? Are people who are a part of our culture, but don't necessarily hold a dark tone, like as opposed to you and to me? Are they culture vultures, or are they still a part of the culture? Or is racism in their mind 24 seven? Okay, great question. Number one, I would say colorism, or what I refer to as light skin supremacy and dark skin supremacy, because you have dark skin people who feel they better because they're original. They don't have no European blood in them. And then you got light skin people who think they better because they look closer to the slave master, right? I would say on a subconscious level, there are very few Africans in the world who have not been affected by light skin supremacy, dark skin supremacy, because the slave empire was operating upon colorism. You feel me? It was so entrenched, especially if you have a Caribbean origin. Because see, in the Caribbean, you had a racial hierarchy that was codified by law. In America, there was no racial hierarchy codified by law. You either black or you white. Even if you was mixed race, you were still black. They called you mulatto, you were still black. There was no special privilege across the board. Now certain colonies, yes, but federally, were you treated different because you was a mulatto? No, you were still black. In America, black, white, black, white, black, white. That's why when Africans from around the world come to America, they can melt in with us better because we never had a racially stratified system of color, right? In the Caribbean, you had mulatto, quadroom, octoroom. They had about 16 different levels. And check this, the pit, your level of skin tone, the brother next to you, to me, y'all might look like the same shade, but to the law, he might be darker. And because he's darker, he can't work in the governmental complex, but you can. And the chocolate one can only work in the field. So in the Caribbean, your skin tone dictated what? Your occupation and aspiration. And that's why we have a skin bleaching problem in the African race today. Do y'all know we spend $10 million? Or is it billion? It might, it's either million or billion. That's how much we spend globally on bleaching our skin. Why? Because privilege in the white man's world, opportunity in the white man's world is accorded based on what? Skin tone. How do you break that? You gotta educate the children differently. But even if you educate the children differently, you don't break that 
unless you create a separate reality for them to participate in. In other words, y'all all my school children, y'all all fifth grade, hypothetically. I teach y'all skin color don't matter. If you got the blood of Africa, you African. The reason the Honorable Marcus Garvey's flag is red, black, and green, red is the first color. Why? It's the blood that makes you African. Not everybody got chocolate skin. It's the blood that makes you African. I got family members, if you looked at them right now, you might think they white and they Africans. So red is the first color because red is the blood. Black is the original color of the ancestors and green is the mineral wealth of our continent. But the point is, even if I teach y'all, black is beautiful in every shade, but you gotta go beg the white man for a job. That education don't mean nothing. Because in order for me to make it out there, I'm gonna have to straighten my hair. In order for me to make it out there, I'm gonna have to bleach my skin. I wanna be a model and I got a voluptuous black body. They don't want this. I'm gonna go get some surgery so I can fit into some small clothes. You see that? So the education is important. But this is where I disagree with a lot of African historians. I don't care how much we teach our kids about their history. If you don't give them opportunities, if they don't get the same opportunities Chinese kids get, if they don't get the same opportunities the Anglo-Saxons get, if they don't get the same opportunities the Italians get, if they don't get the same opportunities the European Jews get, they will go right back to imitating their oppressor. Education is not enough. Education must be married to opportunity. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? I, I speak in prisons. I speak in prisons all the time. Them brothers and sisters in prison are extremely intelligent. They know their history. They know everything about Africa, the slave trade, colonization, but they in jail. You know why? Nobody gave them an opportunity. What good is knowledge of self if nobody's going to give me an opportunity to earn a livable wage? That's why we got mass incarceration. We are $2 trillion people. We spend $30 billion on hair care, ladies. $2 billion on Air Jordans, $4 billion on liquor, $800 million on chicken, turkey, beef, and pork, billions on video games, and we don't even create no jobs. We're the only race who does 